So we all sit comfortably, legs folded if we can. Nice deep breath and we'll begin with three ohms. Om. Om. Sahanavavatu, Sahanau Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavadhi Tamastu Mavitvishavahai, Om Shanti 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 Samasta Janakalyani, Niratam Karunamayam Namami Chinmayam Devam Sadgurum Brahma Vitharam Sadgurum Brahma Vitharam Hari Our Puja Gurudev, Swami Chinmayananda, loved his youths. He would often say, youths are not useless, as society commonly thinks. They are simply used less. And so Gurudev would always prompt his youth that never let society bring you down. Never be a victim to circumstances, be a master of life. This year, 2024, we celebrate the 108th Jayan of our Puja Gurudev. And so what better way to commence this initiative at a national youth satsang than to empower our chicks to be a master like our Swami Chinmayananda. And so today, what we shall do is to explore that topic of mastery, the method of mastery, of mastering the game that is life. And so I'll begin by posing a hypothetical question. What if life was not what it seemed to be? What if the game of life, so to speak, really was a divine cosmic game? What if every single person you met was merely a prop, a token, a pawn in this game of life, and each of life's challenging circumstances was merely an opportunity to level up in the game? What if there was no one here but you, the protagonist of this complex plot, and every other seeming being, place, time, circumstance, were merely fabrications of the matrix, all simply poised in strategic positions to provide an ideal atmosphere in which for you to triumph, should you recognize it. Now granted, this sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, right? <laughs> but did you know that our Hindu scriptures do not exactly refute such a hypothesis? In fact, in the core Vedantic philosophy of our Upanishads, of Vedas, or Bhagavad Gita, can actually be found evidence in support of this theory 
of a transactional enigma. How ironic would it be if this phrase, the game of life that we've been playing with our whole lives was actually literal, not figurative. And assuming for a moment that it was, how would that impact your approach now to life? Would it change your game plan? So I want you to think now, keeping our intelligent mind in sync with this line of thought. Does it make more sense now why scriptures are called the manual to life? See, because every game must have a rule book. And after all, who would be more appropriate to pen instructions on a product than its manufacturer? And hence, scriptures are therefore called the word of God, the manual to life, because the game was designed by him. So who better to write the playbook? I want you to think in line with this when it comes to our topic of mastering the game of life. What game are we really dealing with? And so just as in the world of science, technology, finance, marketing, etc., so to hear, there's a statement in our scripture that says, Yatha binde tata brahmande, that as in the microcosm, so also in the macrocosm. And so Bhagwan, our master manufacturer, possessing all of the necessary insights, has actually penned a supreme user manual called scripture. So in our session today, we will explore what instructions for mastering the created product did that cosmic engineer encode into the scriptic manual that we call Shastra, scriptures? So we shall take a sneak peek into just a few of them today, just to whet our appetite. Why? Because if you try to figure out how to dominate at the game of life without reading the manual, then you're basically just reinventing the wheel, right? There'll be a lot of trial and error. It will be a very tedious process. But with correct interpretation of scriptures, you can come to unlock the cheat codes, so to speak, by which to game the system. So, are you ready to access the universal master key, which can unlock any door to success of your choosing? Our first decryption tonight is extracted from the holy pages of the Bhagavad Gita, wherein Arjuna is in his deep state of despondence. How many of us have studied Bhagavad Gita? by raise of hands. So we're all familiar with the plot. We all know how Bhagavad Gita begins. Arjuna, in this deep state of despondence, as we all are at points in life, at having to face off with his own family, friends, colleagues, as we all do sometimes, and delve headfirst into a situation that he'd rather escape instead of engage as we all face sometimes. When confronted with the Arjuna conundrum of life, what cunning advice did the mastermind Shri Krishna offer? In this excerpt, we are privy to the first counterintuitive but genius response of Bhagwan Shri Krishna as he pitches his first curveball to Arjuna. When he says, standing there on the battlefield, he says, Arjuna, what battlefield are you speaking of? What relatives are you afraid of? He says to Arjuna, do you really think that there are other beings out there inflicting this treacherous warfare against you of their own volition? 
Then he says to, Krish, to Arjuna, he says, think again. They are there and they are inflicting circumstances, certainly, but it is not of their volition. Arjuna, the volition is yours. You are making them act. How? Because this is the secret revealed in Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavan shows there, he says, every single circumstance of life is merely your own karmas, your own actions returning to you in a different morphology. Every single challenge you face has been called to you by the you of the past based on your actions emotional intellectual financial from the most tragic to the most tremendous circumstances of life it was you not them they are merely pawns and so arjuna take responsibility for your actions stand up and fight Sage Ashtavakraji, in a composition called Ashtavakragita, he expounds the same point that Bhagavan Sri Krishna makes very succinctly. In that composition, he says, Apada sampada kale daivat eveti nishchai tripta svasthendriyo nityam navanchatina shochati Ashtavakraji, they are speaking to King Janak Maharaj, Sitama's father. He says to him, he who understands with certitude that misfortunes and fortunes come in their own time through the effects of your past actions. The one that understands this becomes immediately content. He has all of his senses and his mind under control. Neither does he desire nor does he grieve. He becomes free from effort and remains untainted even while engaging actions. What is the lesson for us from this first excerpt? See, in life, and you tell me from your own experience, we often point out the hand that others may have played in our misfortunes. The difficult personalities of others, their lack of cooperation or consideration or their abrasiveness. You are all either in college or working, team projects, bosses, <laughs> colleagues, all of these uh, temp uh, temperamental situations that we face in life and temperamental personalities, the attitudes with which you are challenged, with which you are faced in life has nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with the way you have handled people in the past. This life or previous lives they are all merely pawns to deliver to you your own result. This is what Bhagavan reveals in Bhagavad Gita. And he says, if they were not there, someone else would come along to do exactly the same thing to you. Why? Relationships, colleagues, parents, doesn't matter. It's because you are actually transacting with your own karmas, not them think about it and so the lesson is open your eyes see your own creations at work before you in the shapes and forms of others and what they present and so instead of trying to change others and change what's happening outside our gurudev would say change inside Change the vision, don't change the view. When you change the vision, the view immediately looks different. Our Puja Gurudev Swami Chinmayan, and they used to say, this world is poised to give you moksha, to give you liberation, if 
you can elevate your mind to this superior vision. When we can do that, we begin to transact with the world at a whole different level. Gurudev would say, you change. The world will change around you. Because all of a sudden, the vision that comes is that now I am not transacting with another person. I'm transacting with the future me. Because whatever I do to them determines what comes to me back in future when we respond in this way when our response to situations becomes guided by this lens a twofold transformation occurs first i see every person as a fructification of me from the past and therefore any negativities seem easier to swallow since they are, these people are not doing this to me. I am doing it to myself, actually. <laughs> because it's my actions of the past that are fructifying in the way they are treating me now. See, we never like when others do things to us. <laughs> but if we're doing it to ourselves, then it seems easier to handle. <laughs> Shut up and face your responsibilities. You're doing it. <laughs> so when we can understand karma from this lens, we won't be as angry or upset when situations present. We take a breath and we say, they are just the pawn to bring this to me. My actions are, have actually brought this. And life circumstances becomes much easier to swallow when you feel like you're inflicting it on yourself. They are not doing this to me. Means our Acharya Sandipani in Mumbai would say to us, Vedanta means you can never complain again. Because once you understand it's your karmas coming back to you, who will you complain to? So this is the first transformation by which we can begin to master our circumstances in life. Bring that control back into our hand. If my situations are coming to me because of my actions, I can control, I can change this thing. So this is the first transformation from past into present, understanding it. The second transformation is from present into future, meaning... Second one is that I see my future circumstances of life taking shape before my eyes in the present as I formulate my chosen response to a situation. As I formulate my response, I'm shaping what will come in future. And so I see my future unfolding in the present itself. Again, it puts the power back into my grasp this is truly mastering life <laughs> means once this happens no more complaint about what comes and then pristine responses to what i put out after that so it means nothing from the past can bother me in the present anymore and i'm securing by my present actions a pristine future So nothing from the past can affect present. In the present, I'm securing the future. This is mastery. This is mastering the game of life. I become the carver of my destiny in this way. And in this way, nothing from the past can bother me. Nothing from the future will bother me. This is our first core point. Second one that I'll share, understanding karma siddhanta, the laws of cause and effect in this way, also has another beautiful flip side. It takes the pressure off in life. How? A puja Gurudev would say, you just do your best and leave the rest. Swami Chanman and Ji's famous statement, do your best and leave the rest. How is this? Swami Vidyaranya Swamiji, in his famous composition of Panchadashi, he puts it very beautifully there. He says, if you have put in the work, then rest assured. What is meant for you, no one can take it away from you. He says, yada bhavi natad bhavi, bhavi chet natad anyatha. What is meant for you will come to you. And what is not meant for you, Nothing in this universe will bring it. 
So no matter how many people you think might be plotting against you, if you do what you're supposed to do, nothing can come of that. Similarly, no matter how many challenges are coming, if you do what you're supposed to do, the result that you require will unfold. No matter how much you think the world might be working against you, if it is meant for you, it will be. Bhavi chet natadanyata. No force in this planet can stop what you deserve. So make it so that you deserve better through your own actions. And then, once you've done your best, Guru Dev said, leave the rest. Means have faith. It'll come. You just have to do your best and the universe is obligated to reciprocate. Even Bhagwan Sri Rama, when he took incarnation, said, I can master everything, but yet I will allow the laws of karma, cause and effect to play out. Because when I take form, even I come under the influence of the laws of karma. I must respect the laws that I put in. And so, you do your best. The universe is obligated to reciprocate. In this way, no pressure. Now, the tricky part of this is, though, that the universe does not always reciprocate the way that we think. And that's the problem. Rest assured, however it reciprocates is the for our ultimate evolution. But sometimes it will say yes. Sometimes it says no. Sometimes it says, hold on. You're not seeing the whole picture. So let me show you what you're not seeing. Those ones tend to be the most beautiful circumstances of life. Those are the ones when the aha moment comes years later. When sometimes the greatest sorrow that you've ever faced blossoms into the greatest blessing that you could never have imagined. These are the ones that we should wait for. See, sometimes we're so fixated on a desired outcome that that tunnel vision blocks out the bigger picture. And so sometimes, at those times, the best thing we can do is to get out of our own way and let him act through me. After all, the best view is from above, right? So let him act. Sometimes we have to pay attention to the signs. I don't mean any strange mystical sign. I mean life itself tries to show you. When the universe keeps telling us no, no, no. Vidyaranya Swamiji says, Yada bhavi natad bhavi. What is not meant to be will never be. And so the more we push and push to precipitate situations in accordance with our own forced will, it can actually lead to a lot of pain. Be aware. Pay attention. When the universe is constantly saying no, pause. See, it takes good viveka, good power of discrimination, discernment to figure out when to act and when to take a step back. Make that power of Viveka jagrat in you. That is one of the best qualities for mastering life, Viveka, wise discernment. And when the universe is telling you pause and take a step back, you pause and follow. Follow the words of Bhagwan Shri Krishna when he said to Arjuna, Nimitta matram bhava savyasachin. That Arjuna, you be an instrument in my hands now. This is the next point. That whenever things are going wrong, 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 nothing seems to be working out in life. Don't stop action. Surrender in action. Realize that there is a flaw in your desired projection. And in those moments, let him guide. Sharanagati, surrender. 
See, when we let ourselves become an instrument in the hands of the Lord, like that flute that Bhagavan Sri Krishna plays, when His breath flows through us, the symphony that exudes will be a masterpiece, an unparalleled composition. That masterpiece can be your life. How? Because a master composer will compose nothing less than perfection. And so he can guide our lives much better than we ever could. But what happens to us? Our minds are so filled with so much chatter that we block out the symphony, actually. There's a masterpiece waiting to emanate from all of us. If we could just make our mind quiet enough to hear it from within and allow it to manifest out. Silence the mind. Every once in a while, silence your mind and just listen. Sometimes we have to take circumstances into our own hands. But other times, Bhagwan is trying to tell us, let go. <laughs> See if our hands are busy holding on to everything. How will our hands be open to receive what he's trying to give us? So sometimes the answer isn't hold on, it's let go. Let him give. And so every once in a while, whenever doubt and turmoil is constantly plaguing the mind, silence the mind. And just listen. Let go. That symphony, that's the background shruti of your life, is waiting to reveal itself to you. Those are the moments when you can hear it. And those are the moments when you can tap into something higher to express through you. The initial pieces of advice that Bhagavan Sri Krishna gives Arjuna is Take responsibility for your actions. Get up, act, fight. But in the later parts, he tells him, you know what? When you're not sure how to act, surrender. There's a beauty in inaction. In action. And that's when we allow something higher to channel through us. What's the beauty in that? See, the cause inevitably intuits in and through its effect. And so, Tat Brahma Aham Asmi. That Brahman, that supreme reality, that supreme divinity is here itself. And so, Bhagavan is showing Arjuna, you master this, master this, and you can master the world because the master and his manual must be here itself if the cause pervades the effect so you can tap into the manual to life and the master codes from within tat brahma aham asmi you are that already believe in this realization actually lies the ultimate mastery of the game of life because when we can tune to this one, we realize the revelation that there are actually no circumstances to master in life. Because life has nothing to do with me. The real me. This is next level of thinking now. Bhagavan Shri Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, he says, sense organs and mind are transacting amongst sense objects. I have nothing to do with it. Means the sense organs, this body, even this mind are the lower I, the lower me within. There's a higher I also, that divine soul within. This lower eye should be guided. Guide them as best as you can. But regardless of what challenges, what joys or failures, this eye, this lower eye may meet with. Know that those cannot touch you. The real you, 
the immortal eye. It cannot ever be tainted by mortality, its inefficiencies or its calamities. And that is what you are. You are so much more than this <laughs> fickle mortal frame. And in our moments of quietude, when we can tap into that divine within and act from there, the mastery with which we transact with this world is amazing. This is the final and ultimate mastery in the game of life. And so my takeaway message to all of you today is climb the ladder step by step. Begin like Arjuna, taking responsibility for your actions as they fructify from past into present. But little by little, transcend that lower eye that is acting in that manner and connect to the higher eye within. When we act from there, true mastery will really come. And then one day, like all of our realized masters, we will begin to experience the bliss of that I also. We can. And if we can, we must. Or we will. Yes? So just believe. Have Shraddha. Shraddha vayan labhati jnanam. So this much I wanted to share with you all today. Different angles to look at our karmas and the game of life. Now, if there's questions on that, we can open up. So I'll pass back to Nikhil now. Hadi yeah. Thank you, Jyotiji. Um, that's actually a, a nice talk uh, to begin with, uh, begin the session actually to hear. Um, we'll be creating a lot of actions uh, throughout the year in any avenue that we are in right now right um so that's a good point to start the year with the floor is open for questions so if anybody wants to share them you can unmute yourself go ahead if not you can also send it via chat to me directly and i can ask that to jyotiji while you're not doing that um i had a question jyotiji um so <clears throat> There are, I mean, we see a lot of people around uh, who also uh, keep putting a lot of effort in a particular direction, right? Uh, in trying to achieve something. Um, and if, even though their effort and everything is coming from a good standpoint, good place where they ultimately want to kind of reach that goal, right? But they also face a lot of hardships in that journey while going through that. And somewhat later on, after like trying for good 10 years, maybe I'm putting a number to it, uh, they achieve success. Uh, but how would you define that in the sense that you explained right now, mm -hmm. right? Because if I'm facing hardships, then there's also that realization that I should have that maybe this is not for me. This is not something that I'm supposed to go in this direction mm -hmm. and probably supposed to reevaluate and go in a different direction. Um, then how do you, how do you, put this into context? Mm, very nice question. So this is where the concept of Viveka becomes extremely important. That wise discernment within us to differentiate what should be done, when to engage and when to pull back. See, we're all born with a blueprint. Each of us comes our prarabdha, our karmas of the past, determine certain circumstances that have to fructify in life. And how that comes is, not everything that seems bad is bad. <laughs> Not everything that seems like a challenging situation is necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes negative karmas, actually sometimes positive karmas, take the help of a little negative karma in order to fructify the best out of us. So whenever challenges are constantly coming, there's two options. One option is either this is really not my path and I need to use Viveka and decide when to stop. Or second is maybe it's that good karma taking the help of a little bad karma just to build my character in this circumstance. Which one it is 
That's the concept of viveka. Viveka comes from the word which. Which dhatu means to separate the verbal root. That separation of being able to analyze out what's the different options and which one is the wisest one for me. At the end of the day, the blueprint of how our karmas are supposed to unfold are stored within each of us. You will know the answer from within. But that quietude of mind and that viveka has to be there to be able to make that decision wisely. So Every definitely, we'll yeah. So definitely, one could also say that that silence of mind that you mentioned earlier in the talk is essentially required, even if you face hardship in your journey, to determine whether it's that hardship that you're facing is teaching you a lesson or pulling you in a different direction. And I mean, obviously, we have all that. We have the capability, the innate capability, which we are born with, to kind of make that kind of um, decision. Right. There's right. another step to that, which is that if you discern this is what I'm supposed to be learning from this thing, and you implement that correctly, immediately that situation disappears. And so you realize when you've made the right decision. If it keeps going, then a different decision was the one. You made the wrong decision, that's all. Life itself is, is very nice. It's very scientifically put together, actually, very systematically put together by Bhagwan. Bhagwan is called Karma Paladata means the giver of the fruits of our actions. And so the entire plot is well put together. It's like going through school. You have to ace first grade before you can get into second grade. And so just so with the trials of life, the minute you ace one, it disappears from life and then you go to the next one. If you've had experiences in life where the same problem seems to be coming over yeah. and over and over, then you haven't faced it properly. And the minute you face that thing, well, you say, hey, this is not about the other person. This is about me. What am I supposed to learn here? And you implement that, you'll see how that problem will just disappear. disappear. You, have, yeah. you have to ace that one to go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So we can know the answers. The yeah. life itself will show us, guide us, if we're doing the right thing. A very nice question. Thank you, Nikhil. Yeah, it's actually like a game, you know, you solve that, but I mean, it's level up uh, in Correct. the actual Correct. video game. <laughs> it is you know. actually a game. Yeah. Yeah. Life yeah. is actually a game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the highest just... levels of our scripture, when it begins to show the game, you start to really see it. It's a beautiful thing. Sorry, please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, uh, no, thank you. Uh, I have a question here. Um, so somebody has asked, um, uh, what about the mental states that is being tortured by different phobias that one can have? Are they also products of past karmas, um, mm. like uh, the physical circumstances, like wars or disease, like pandemic, etc.? Are those also uh, uh, an effect of past karmas? And in addition to that, uh, the question also is that mental state choices that one makes in the moment rather be than being a result of the past karmas. Mm. Good. So this question looks at something called Satta Treya. Mm -hmm. In our Vedantic philosophy, there are three, they're called three ontological planes of existence. So there is a transactional plane, which is right here, the way we're talking and interacting. There is a mental plane. So your transactional plane is called Vyavaharika Satta. Then there's a mental plane of transaction called Pratibhasika Satta. That's the plane of dreams. It's the plane of internal transactions, means our emotions, the way we think, daydreaming, or internally thinking of things. That's a mental plane. And there's the third plane, Paramartika Satta. That's the plane of the ultimate, the highest truth, Brahman. All of our transactions happen within the mental plane and the physical transactional plane, Vyavahara and Pratibhasa. And so at these two levels, we can create karmas, we can overcome karmas. At these two levels, our actions of the past are contributing to what's coming in the present state. So that question with respect to our mental attitudes, mental suffering, phobias, and all of that, that's based on our karmas of the past, that we didn't control our mind well, that we exposed our mind to unnecessary negativities and things like that. And so that's fructifying in the mental plane now in terms of turbulence of mind. We have five sense organs. These are the five ways that anything enters into us from those five sense organs into the mind. And so in Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan Shri Krishna constantly warns us, guard your ahara. Be careful of what you're taking in through these five because garbage in, garbage out. The more negativities you take in, it's going to manifest back out of you. It's going to plague that mind. So phobias and all of these negativities are 
karma is acting at the subtle level, at the mental plane. The second part of the question, wars and all of these things, famine that's happening in the world, that's at the transactional, the physical second satta, where again, karmas are interacting. But there it's more of a samashti karma. It means there's individual karma and there's totality karma also. So people who have similar negative karmas to work out will be put in similar situations in one part of the world, wars, famine, those type of natural disasters to suffer that karma together, actually, and not necessarily suffer, but to grow from it together also. That's the opportunity. So this is how karmas work at those levels. I hope I answered that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have another question. Um, you have to tell me the name of who was, who's asking the okay. question so I can see okay. their face. <laughs> sure thing, sure thing. Uh, this is from uh, Sandhya Ramachandran. The previous one was from uh, Sean. Um, this okay. is from Sandhya Ramachandran. Uh, she so these says, are my uh, chicks from Atlanta. Very good. <laughs> okay. Okay, Go nice. Okay. Uh, so Sandhya says, uh, I understand Bhagwan says that past actions influence the present circumstances and the actions we take now will impact the future. But how do we explain tragic life situations that we that have happened to innocent people. For example, if a young child dies from a car accident, it doesn't seem immediately clear where the laws of karma apply in situations like this. Mm, very nice. Good question. Actually, circumstances like that prove the laws of karma. If we were to think a little deeper. See, if a child dies, terrible car accident early in life, or let's go even earlier, when a child is born, he hasn't committed any karmas yet, just born, right? How do you explain why one child is born in very comfortable circumstances in life and another child is born in a dumpster? They've just been born. They haven't committed any act. <laughs> what cause-effect relationship can there be there? And this is what proves concepts or adds to the fuel for concepts like reincarnation that unless karmas were committed in a previous lifetime, how do you explain circumstances at birth itself? Nothing has been done yet. So what is fructifying these situations must be based on something previous. And therefore, it's part of what's used for the proof of reincarnation being an intelligent hypothesis. So this is what explains those circumstances. Second thing and last point I'll make on this is, Santhya made the point, an innocent child. No one is innocent. When it comes to karmas, if it has come, you've done something in previous life. So no one innocently gets the result of something they haven't done. In our Upanishads, Bhagavan Shankaracharya has written Bhashya and all of them. And there's two concepts that he talks about. One is Akrita Abhyagama Dosha and Krita Vipranasha Dosha. What are these two? It's the defect of receiving the result of something you didn't do or getting the result of something you didn't put in the work for. Neither of these can happen. They don't make sense. How can you get the result for something when you didn't put in the work? That's not fair. And so these two doshas, these two defects are used to define why the law of cause and effect is a perfectly balanced law. Because it says if your God can give you the result of something you didn't do, <laughs> can make you born in a dumpster when you're just born, you haven't done anything bad. And I don't want a God that's like that. <laughs> I want a God that's fair. And so these two doshas show that reincarnation, past life actions, these laws of karma siddhanta have to be acting together in this way, because that's the only way Bhagavan can fairly distribute karmas in our life. And so in that way, no one is innocent, really. We're all getting the results of our actions, bad and good also. Uh, th this is interesting because the next question is related to this. Um, and I, I also was thinking about it while you were asking, uh, while you were explaining, sorry. Uh, this comes from Anuhya uh, Kanji Batla. Uh, if, sorry if I misspelled your name. Uh, if every situation is our own karma committing, coming back to us, how does God match up karmas of other individuals to make them interact with us? Hmm. And that is the perfection of the mastermind in the game that he can bring karmas from everywhere together. I remember Swami both Hatman and Nidji when we had started our Vedanta course in Mumbai. He said, imagine you people from India, USA, 
Trinidad, France, China. We had people from so many. You all had to come together perfectly in this course to work out your karmas together. Who else can plan things so perfectly than someone who has a master view of the whole picture? And that's why we say Bhagwan is karma paladhata. That's how Bhagwan is described in our bhashas, in our scriptures. Karma paladhata. Only he can give the results of actions because only someone with a way supra super computer brain can link all of these different karmas together in that way to put the right people together amazing yeah i mean if if you don't mind if i can take an example that is um uh, i think um somebody mentioned uh sunday i think mentioned that the child a young innocent child dies in a car accident if the person who's driving the car and there are two cars colliding if the other person who probably is responsible is a drunk driver and has had past offenses maybe this is the follow of his karma in a way and the life is probably trying to teach him uh, or her uh, that this could even i mean this has happened and now it's at least now that you learn from this action and the innocent child from the past karma is also facing the action of her past karma right uh, is that is that something Correct, correct. It's so much more complex than that. If you begin to look at, at circumstance, means the parents in that circumstance had to deserve some sort of karma to lose a True. child. True. The drunk driver had to deserve this thing for him to wake up. That child actually is the one that suffers the least, even though we think an innocent child, because they've died and they're gone, they're happy actually. <laughs> so the innocent child actually is not suffering anything. They're released. But those parents had some karma to suffer. That driver had some karma. So look at how many circumstances coming together to fructify one thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a question which is related to the previous answer that you gave. Um, you mentioned, uh, this is from Sapna, uh, you said something about Satatraya, uh, which is the third phase. Um, can you again uh, explain what that is? Um, <clears throat> Yeah. Sure, sure. So this is very beautiful concept. In our core Advaitic philosophy, this comes. So this is uh, fundamentals of Vedanta. There are three ontological planes of existence, means three metaphysical planes of existence. The highest one is the plane of the ultimate supreme reality called Paramartika. Satta, Satta means a plane. Paramartha means the highest, the supreme. So Paramartika Satta is the first one. The second one is called Vyavahara. Vyavahara is transactional world. So Vyavaharik Satta, this world of transaction, which is the world we all live in. And the beauty of Vedanta is it talks about a third level, which most people don't usually give reality to, which is Pratibhasika Satta. Pratibhasa means um, projections, visions, imaginations, those type of things. Vedanta gives reality even to our imaginations, our thoughts, our mental projections, all of these things, because it says this plays probably an even stronger role in our life and its unfoldment. Your mind is what determines everything in life. Your mind is who you identify as. You identify more as your mind than your body, actually. And so it gives reality to all of these three levels in which transactional life can take place. So it's just three... Uh, Three states, three three levels of reality, so to speak. Thank you. That's from uh, who? Sapna. Sapna. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two more. That. Yeah, two more questions, and then I think uh, coming to an end. Uh, this one, the first one is from Vishwa. Um, one was never uh, not ultimate witness. Uh, Turiya, we see three ego slash world combinations come and go, and decisions made in each. Therefore, there is a hundred percent no free will. Even the decision to do meditation, japa, etc., is like a Netflix movie playing, and nothing can ever happen to change anything. Therefore, the desire to be liberated and journey to liberation are both completely fictional and do not change anything. The realization doesn't exist. <laughs> so everything was correct up until the last statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what are your thoughts on this? Mm, so. Correct, like correct line of thinking. These transactional levels of reality, especially, and that's why it perfectly matches with our topic for today, the game of life. Because as we go through the game of life, what we're going to realize is everything that was said in that question. It is a game. It's all even meditation is sometimes just that movie playing in your mind, like you see. And the higher and deeper, the higher we go and the deeper we go. 
is the more we're going to realize the game that's unfolding around. And that's why Bhagavan Shri Krishna spoke that way to Arjuna. He said, what battlefield? <laughs> what relatives? What are you so worried about? In Mandukya Upanishads, which is one of the highest Upanishads to be studied, actually what they talk about there is that there's not three sattas. It actually says there's two. Because your imaginary world it means the world of imagination and projection is actually no different from the transactional world that you're seeing. There's no way for you to validate a difference between these two. How do you know the world that's happening around you? Everything you know, you only know through your mind. Even if I say this desk is hard, the hardness of this desk is what? The proprioception of my finger touching this thing, it's transferring an electrical impulse all the way to my brain and my brain tells me hard which means the only way i know this desk is hard is because my brain told me that means it's my mind that's telling and we've seen anyone you don't even need to study medicine to know hallucinations exist you can see something before you that is not actually there so can you actually trust your sense organs Everything we know in the physical world is only known through our mind. So essentially, is there really a Vyavaharik Satta, a transactional world, or is everything Pratibhasa? Is everything in our mind only? And some of the schools of uh, Baudhik traditions actually ascribe to that, that they say, there's no, you cannot validate the existence of a transactional world because everything is coming through your mind. So everything is in your mind only. If you start thinking along those lines, you realize, is this thing really a game or not? And especially when you begin to master certain circumstances and you realize the minute I master this, it disappears. How did that happen? Is in my mind projecting these things or not? You start to realize the game of life. And the more you transcend that, you're going to realize if this is really a game, where, where is their bondage? Where is their moksha? So only the one who's bound can need to be muktaha. And the one who's bound is who? This I. This transactional eye, which I spoke about in my talk as the lower eye. Your true identity is the higher eye, the supreme divinity. And so only the lower eye is actually bound. And only the lower eye needs moksha. But the lower eye is the illusion. It's the false eye. So actually, neither is there bondage, neither do you need moksha then. The realization of this is what is called realization. That's why it's called realization. <laughs> you have to realize this. And therefore, realization is the only ultimate truth. Nothing else is true. Neither bondage nor moksha. Good insight, Vishwa. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the last question and three announcements and we can end the talk today. Um, at what point should we let Bhagwan take control of our life? And what point should we allow ourselves to take control? Mm, beautiful. So in a text called Yoga Vasishtha, Guru Vasishtha actually teaching Sri Rama when he was a student, told him everything is achieved in life through hard work. And that's the baseline we should always go with. You always do what you need to do. Do your best, like Gurudev said, and leave the rest. If after having done and done and done, <laughs> you really realize nothing else can be done, that's the point when you surrender to Bhagwan. That's the point when you just, and surrender doesn't mean you stop acting. Like I said, surrender doesn't mean don't act. It means act in a bhava of surrender, a spirit of surrender. So you keep doing what you think you need to do, but be open to something else acting through you. It means a lot of times what's happening is that the turbulence in our mind is not allowing us to see what's the right path that needs to be taken. So that act of surrender isn't really Bhagavan is doing something for me. It's the act that I'm surrendering this mind so I can finally let it stop its chatter. And then the right plan will reveal itself to me. See, like I said, we're all born with a blueprint in life. There's a way of things that are meant to unfold. And because of our ego, we keep pushing things in different directions. You quieten your mind, all of the chatter will fall away and you will see the blueprint. It will reveal it to you. So in that way, that's your point. When you surrender, that's the concept of surrendering. The blueprint reveals itself to you. Then naturally, you'll know what's the right decision to make. So that's the concept of surrender probably also the right time to start japa or meditation 
uh, <laughs> to, to, to silence your point. To quiet the mind, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you, Jyoti ji, once again. Um, Excellent I, questions from everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.